Hello and welcome to this very special Royal Scottish Geographical Society event. I'm Dr Vanessa Collingridge and it's my great pleasure to be speaking in a moment with two exceptional scientists and environmental advocates about the biggest threat to our planet in human history, climate change. Professor Tim Flannery has had many job titles in his life. Scientist, explorer, conservationist, writer, former Chief Commissioner of Australia's Climate Commission and since 2013, leader of the Climate Council. He's written books on everything from possums and tree kangaroos to the best-selling The Future Eaters, The Weather Makers and his latest book, The Climate Cure, Solving the Climate Emergency in the Era of COVID-19. As well as the huge honour of having the greater monkey-faced bat Terralopex flannerii named after him. He's also received a whole raft of awards, including the 2005 Humanist of the Year and Australian of the Year in 2007. But all that is as nothing compared to having just been awarded the RSGS's Geddes Environmental Medal, along with Honorary Fellowship of the Society. More on that later. Well, joining Tim and me is Professor Ian Stewart, a well-known face on TV with an MBE for Services to Geography and Geology Education. Ian is also the Al Hassan Bin Talal Research Chair in Sustainability for Royal Scientific Society in Jordan and Professor of Geoscience Communication at the University of Plymouth. He currently holds a UNESCO Chair in Geoscience and Society and of course is President of the Royal Scottish Geographical Society. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Hi. Tim, Thank you if, so much, Vanessa. Oh, you're most welcome. If I could start with you, I've got to ask, the greater monkey-faced bat, how on earth did that happen? Well, um, a student of mine who was re revising the monkey-faced bats, uh, which live only in the Solomon Islands, um, discovered a new species. It had been hidden away in museum collections for years and just hadn't been really recognised. But it was an enormous animal. It's, it's got a wingspan, you know, well over a metre, close to two metres. It's entirely black, a ferocious looking thing. It's got teeth that can crack coconuts, you know, green coconuts. And um, he came to me one day and said, um, look, I'd like to honour you by naming this animal after you. And I said, oh, that's very kind. I said, yes, but is it really an honour having a monkey face bat named after yourself? I, I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, he did. Well, it's very impressive indeed. And, um, and the other thing, of course, is that while we're on Tim Flannery trivia, I can help noticing your middle name is Fridjof which conjures up memories, of course, of another scientist and explorer, uh, Vijof Nansen, who, of course, was also an RSGS medalist and fellow. So is there a link there? Look, th there is a link, Vanessa. Um, it's not a blood link, but, but my family, uh, Otto Sverdrup was part of my family, um, obviously had a lot to do with, um, with Nansen. And the, the Nansen, or the Fridjof name, became... Um, somehow part of my family tradition. So my grandfather was a fridge off, my maternal grandfather, and the name passed on to me. So, and I'm very proud to have it. It, it caused me some difficulties at school, you know, but, but, uh, but uh, I've grown into it. Okay, and um, Ian, I'm afraid, any pressure there? Have, have you had a, a weird rock or a weird relative that you've exchanged names with? I've not got a rock, which is what you might expect, but I've got an ant named after me. Kerapakis Ian Stuarty, which is a cracker of an ant. It's the, it's in Madagascar. It's the top top predator ant in the community. And we were filming in Madagascar in the rainforest, and the biologist had thought he might see a new species. He said he got hunched they're going to see a new species. And so on camera, I said to him, "Do you think we'll find a new series?" And he said, "Ian, if we find a new species, I'll name it after your mum." And then like an hour later, we got this new species. It was confirmed later on. Of course, he was very sheepish. He didn't really want to, you know, it's a big deal on a new species. And, and after some discussions, he decided he would name it after me, not after my mum, which I was very pleased about. And my mum was devastated. So, yeah. Oh, dear. That, that, that won't work well at family Christmases, will it? No. But uh... <laughs> now, Tim, as I mentioned in my introduction, 
You've long been immersed in the, the natural history of Australia and the whole Pacific region, really. So how did you initially get interested in that? And what was the link then to opening your eyes to the wider ecological challenges that humans have wrought across the world? Well, it's interesting, you know, growing up as a, an Australian of European heritage, because what you're taught in school just jars with everything you see around you. You know, we're taught about Europe. I was taught the, the kings and queens of England as part of my primary school teachings. And you know, it was a European history. The, the fairy stories were European. And yet just outside my door was this fabulous environment that barely rated a mention. And I just became so interested in, in wondering where that environment came from. How do I fit in with it? You know, what are Europeans doing to the place? So, so that, was, that was my sort of early history. Um, I then became fascinated with Melanesia. I loved the island of New Guinea and its people and the Solomons and Fiji and so forth. And I, I spent 20 or 30 years working up there, um, in some cases really on the other side of the frontier, working with indigenous people who had very little contact with the outside world. And so I, I've, to me, there is no more wonderful place. You know, being, it's funny, living in Sydney, it must be a bit like being a Scot in the 18th century. You weren't in the centre of things, you weren't in London, but you could observe from the outside. And of course, the Scottish Enlightenment came from that, that very privileged position of being part of it, but not quite in the centre. And I, I really feel that in Australia, that, that I'm, you know, immersed in this incredibly rich environment that forces me to think differently. And yet I'm part of that that mainstream culture. And given that kind of outsider's privileged position in many ways, how did that work that you were doing in biodiversity lead you to really shifting your orientation to, and I'm going to use a quote here that's going to make you blush, um, NASA's Professor James Hansen has called you arguably the world authority on climate change. And of course you've done another best-selling book. So how have you shifted that gaze from biodiversity on the earth to the climate? Look, Vanessa, I was very fortunate to have studied geology at university. I did a master's in geology. So climate is just an essential part of that. You, you, you grow up with a view that the, the world's climate can change. I was working in Melanesia and again, very fortunate that I was just at the tail end of the great age of exploration for mammals in, in Melanesia. I discovered five kinds of tree kangaroos. You know, there's only 17 known, but so that was amazing. And I had the privilege of climbing many of the high mountains in New Guinea and documenting the biodiversity that lived on those summits. But I noticed wherever I went that the tree line was retracting upwards. So, and, and I realized eventually this was due to a changing climate, that the world's climate was already changing. And it was at that point that I really thought I've got to learn more about climate change. So I really put myself through a new educational process, I guess, of learning everything I could about climate. And uh, I realized that even though I'm a trained scientist, I'd grossly underestimated the threat that climate change presented to the world. And so I made a very deliberate decision to, to change course. and. Uh, I left that wonderful world of exploring for new mammals behind and entered the, the climate arena. And that's where I've been pretty much ever since. Ian, you've had a similar journey to, in some ways, to, to what Tim's just described. Was it a deliberate decision to shift mm -hmm. focus or an inevitable progression for you? A little bit of both, I think, and television definitely motivated me. I mean, when I started with making television programs, it was about getting geology out to a wider public. But I'd made about three, three big series, and then I got asked to do this series on climate change, climate wars. And, um, and actually, one of the key texts for that was Tim's The Weathermakers, which, and that quote from James Hansen, it's an interesting one, because the, the thing with climate change is it's so sprawling, it's massive, it's all over the place that actually, um, you know, you can't be an, you can only be an expert in one kind of small area. And most, that's where most climate scientists focus on their one area. And so it takes the likes of Tim to be bold enough to dwell into these other areas. I would never have done it if it hadn't been for the fact that I was filming a television series. And I went and I spoke to all the different aspects and I went and I spoke to a lot of the climate skeptics I went to the Heartlands Institute in, in the States, which was the, the absolute kind of epicenter of all of this. 
And one of the interesting things that came out of that was met most of the big skeptics, the scientific skeptics, were geologists. <laughs> and, and they used the unfamiliarity of the geological record as evidence that, oh, it's always been, you know, climate's always changing. And so really some very powerful critics of climate change came from geology. So that sent me on a, a little bit of a collision course with my subject, because until then, I saw geology as a good thing. But of course, increasingly, it was getting seen as the problem. And I still in this quandary, because to my mind, geology and geoscience and the, you know, the science of the planet is the way out of where we're going. But we first have almost like an alcoholic. We have to recognize that if we're going to be wedded to this thing called oil and gas and, and, the, and the old way of thinking, like we just can take things out of the ground, and not really care about where it's come from, then you know, we're going nowhere and we don't deserve to. So my thing now is all about looking forward, looking at the, the, the purpose of what geology is. And just one final thought on that is, um, Tim mentioned the Scottish Enlightenment. If you go back to Hutton, something like the second paragraph in Hutton's book, he talks about this world as a habitable world and the wisdom of its formation that, that wisdom maintains. In other words, we want to understand the world in order to maintain it as a habitable world. And I think that fits with sustainable development. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Um, Tim, in terms of habitable worlds, Australia has had some extreme weather events, some real challenges in terms of the floods and the fires that have really wreaked havoc across the continent. How have those kind of really significant events impacted upon the public consciousness um, of Australians about climate change and also the political and economic debates as well. Vanessa, you know, Australia, Australia's dilemma is really the world dilemma distilled because we are heavily dependent upon fossil fuel resources. We're the world's largest exporter of coal. We're the world's second largest exporter of natural gas. Um, and yet we are the people who are suffering this extraordinary impact. So average temperatures over the continent of Australia have risen already by one and a half degrees Celsius. The rest of the world is about 1.2. Things are warmer over Australia. And just over the last few years, we've had what amounts really to almost a baptism of fire. We, uh, the black summer fires of 2019, 2020 uh, were like nothing I've ever experienced. I've lost a house to a bushfire. I've saved another house from a bushfire. I know what bushfires are like. But up until last summer, the maximum area of the, the, the temperate forests in Australia that would burn in any one fire season was at maximum 2%. Last year, it was 21%, which is um, it's, um, it's almost incomprehensible at order of magnitude leap. And the suffering that that then uh, brought about was on a, an enormous scale. We lost 33 people to the flames, but 450 more and still counting from respiratory diseases from the smoke. We lost uh, 6,000 houses. You know, on, on Kangaroo Island, 40,000 koalas burnt to death. It's, it's hard to comprehend the sort of impacts that we're seeing now. And we know this isn't going to be the last fire like this. You know, we are seeing more and more extreme weather. And what extinguished those fires, I should say, in, in, in late February last year was catastrophic flooding that killed more people. And we're now seeing yet more catastrophic flooding in Australia on a scale we haven't seen for many years, and certainly in terms of impact on the built environment, because there's now so many Australians, it's, it's, it's really pretty unprecedented impact. So we are seeing more and more consequences of climate change. The public awareness is, has never been higher, and yet we still face this dilemma. How can we move forward um, while we still have this dependency on fossil fuels. I think, by the way, Australia is, is resolving it. And over the next five to 10 years, we'll see the resolution, but it's going to mean working together as never before. We, we can't leave any communities behind. We can't afford to leave our coal miners behind to, to, to wallow in poverty. If we're going to do this, we need to work together as a nation for a better outcome. And, and that's difficult, that's hard politics. Mm. And talking about politics, then you've obviously just published uh, recently your book on climate change uh, and the climate cure. What do you think Australia should be doing right now? What, what can people do and politicians be doing? Well, it's interesting, Vanessa. I watched um, in, in uh, early last year as, as the COVID 
crisis, the pandemic unfolded. And I met our chief health officer in January, late January, and he was saying how concerned he was at that time. And he is a very, very good scientific officer. He had the ear of the prime minister and other key ministers. And he said to them, you know, in the middle of February, if you want to control this, you've got to stop international travel. You've got to stop travel from China. The economic consequences of doing that were very substantial for our country, but, but the prime minister did it, thank heavens. By the middle of March with, you know, the, the pandemic numbers that were growing from hundreds to, to thousands, um, we knew we had to have a hard lockdown. And as tough as that was, the government did it with yet more economic consequences and social consequences. And Australia, as a result, has been, we've been very well served by those decisions. We haven't had the scale of the pandemic that's been seen overseas. And really the, the formula that was followed was just threefold. First thing, you stop the spread. You know, and if you apply that to climate change, we'd, we'd reduce our dependency on fossil fuels. That's the equivalent of stopping the spread. Second thing you've got to do is make sure you've got enough emergency capacity to deal with the people who are already affected. In climate change terms, that means a much more equitable distribution of the sort of uh, the resource base, if you want, to make sure that people are not, um, they're not left to hang out to dry in a fire or a flood or whatever. We've got to make sure everyone's covered. We've got to make sure we can protect assets like the Great Barrier Reef, their casualties as well, you know. So we, we have to work together as a nation as never before, really, to make sure that our national casualty room is sufficient to deal with the fallout that we've felt already. And thirdly, you've got to search for a cure. And this is where Ian, will, I'm sure, as a geologist, will, will understand, you know, the Earth system balances itself over time. So the vaccine, the cure for climate change, is um, it's uncertain and it's going to take a lot of work, but we know it involves drawdown. And I think no one has said it better than Sir David Attenborough in his, you know, A Life, a Life on Earth, where he said, you know, we start by treating our forests better, protecting our forests, because they absorb carbon. They help buffer us against climatic extremes. We've got to treat the oceans better as well. And we also have to search for means of drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, they're not going to be easy to come by, but we know that we can use silicate rocks, for example, to do some of that work. We may be able to use seaweed. We may be able to use industrial processes like direct air capture to do that. But these are all challenges for the future. And uh, if we take that threefold approach to climate change, I'm absolutely convinced that we can, we can come through this with minimum damage. The tragedy for Australia is that while the federal government has applied that method to the COVID uh, pandemic with great success, it refuses to do so for climate. And that it, it's just, a, it's, a, it's because of the money that's involved, the short-term wealth that's involved from fossil fuels. Um, Ian, I'm gonna to come to you in a minute and talk about what you've been involved with in, in the UK and particularly Scotland. But Tim, before I get to that, I'm really interested and where the general population is sitting in the debate over climate change. How much have most ordinary Australians acknowledged and embraced the fact that we are experiencing climate change, that climate change is behind so much of, of the environmental challenges that Australia is facing right now? Have you had things like the school strikes, have you had kind of mass movements against climate change? Look, we have had the school strikes and they were on an enormous scale here. And could I just pay tribute to Greta Thunberg, my predecessor as the Gettys medalist for the uh, uh, for last year. She, she did enormous things. Um, and, you know, in Australia, I think there's been a, a slow awakening for a number of years. You know, I, I'm the chief Councillor at the Climate Council, and, and that's our job is to make people aware of climate change. So we've, we've been winning that battle fairly slowly, but I think the fires really changed Australia. They were in your face in a way that nothing else has been, either the smoke or the flames or the, the disruption was there for everyone to see. You know, today, there's been some surveys that suggest, you know, over 80% of Australians recognise climate change and want some action taken. So we're in a good position, but you know we are held to ransom effectively by probably 20 to 25 federal parliamentarians who uh, have been working very closely with the fossil fuel industry. And um, 
make sure that action is stymied at the federal level. You know, even our conservative governments at the state level are doing marvellous things. It's really just at the national level that we're being held back. Ian, you've been working actively in terms of things like your citizens' assembly in Scotland. What have you learned through that, and other people have learned through that, in terms of just mobilising all those different areas of support that you need for people really to get on this and get get moving to see some action? Yeah, I think this is the fun, the real nub of the, the problem is how do you move forward? You know, it, it, Traditionally, individuals and communities have looked to government and business saying, look, what power do we have? We have to make big changes and the big changes can only come at the top. And meanwhile, the people at the top look down and go, well, until we've got the consensus of the customer or the population, the citizens, we're not going to go in that direction. And I suspect those federal lawmakers as well as the, you know, they're looking at the constituency and if the constituency is rooted in that resource base, then they're very nervous. I think what was, what's been really interesting, I think is for a long while from the science community, we've fixated on these climate skeptics and they're definitely there and they're very disruptive. But I think in doing that, we've taken the eye off the ball that actually um, a lot of most people are somewhere in the middle. You know, they shrug and they say, yeah, it's probably happening, but what can we do? You know, and it's complicated and you hear all these scientists talking and, and we talk about climate and then we talk about weather and, you know, and, and, and is this weather related to it? And, this, and it's really complicated. So I think that what has been really interesting is trying to dive into, from the science side, us been a little bit more cognizant of how complicated this is and also you know again this, this is something i hold my help self up a bit often just talking about the science without talking about the solutions so people want to know what to do about it um so what's been fantastic about the climate assembly so the scottish climate assembly 100 people demographically represented from across scotland for all aspects but including their views on climate change so some very skeptical thinks a lot of rubbish tax dodge by you know excuse by the government to collect more taxes. Other people, um, small number, really quite um, uh, passionate about this and they're very knowledgeable. But most people in the middle, you know, that messy middle. So having seven weekends for people to sit down, what we call slow cook politics, you know, in this world of fast food politics, slow food politics, where they learn, they hear some experts come in and talk about it. But more importantly, gradually over the weekend, spend more and more time talking themselves their own life experiences. And actually what has come out is very radical. And it's because, I mean, Tim will get that. Actually, the science is really clear. And, and the hard bits that the scientists dodge are what we do about it. Because as soon as you get to that bit, the scientists are just like everyone else. And I think that's where the, it's been really encouraging is people willing to, to see their country as a country in transformation and transition. And now obviously in Scotland, we've got some great benefits. Large, we've got loads of renewable energy. We've got, you know, we get rid of our last coal fire power station maybe 10 years ago. Peterhead near Aberdeen is our last gas fire power station. So we're going to be renewable energy. But we've also got this legacy of this North Sea oil industry. But that was, that was waning anyway. So it feeds into, a, a, you know, a narrative about a country that was going to have to change anyway. And so what we're seeing is people grab hold of this and say, let's have a green future. And it's, you know, Tim was saying about not leaving the coal miners of, you know, Queensland and the East Coast behind. We, we can't leave the oil workers behind. But that's about transition into this new green jobs and new green economy. Um, I think, interestingly enough, for Australia, um, there is huge potential there, you know, because a lot of the solutions require resources. You know, we, don't, we shouldn't delude ourselves. You know, someone said to me, uh, uh, any future with a lot less carbon in it is going to have a lot more mining in it. Now, I don't know if, if people are ready for that. But, and that mining has to be done in the right way. But the world is changing. And I think we're seeing a dramatic shift and it's seeing hundred bunch of normal people come to that conclusion and be very radical about it. It's given me a huge promise. Jim, what about you? Oh, look, look what Ian's saying is, is so interesting. And so it, it resonates so much with me. You know, Australia and Scotland have had this, this shared history of dependence on fossil fuels. And we've both got the same opportunity. I mean, Scotland's got, you've got wind resources, I guess, to power Great Britain, I suspect, up there. Um, you know, we've got huge solar resources in Australia. And, you know, we're, I, I feel as if we're a bit like an orangutan in the forest trees. You know, we've got a secure hand on one branch here, 
but we know we have to go over to the other branch, but we've got to let go of this one for a minute before we grab the new one. <laughs> and it's that, 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 that issue of letting go of the old and grasping the new and that, that new opportunity. We're, we're, we're hung up in the middle at the moment. And um, there, is, there is fear and for very good reason, communities will be impacted if this isn't handled well. So, and you're, what you're doing Ian with these, I think you call them community assemblies is a brilliant idea. I, I wish we had those going in Australia. You know, I, I well, did a similar sort of thing when I was climate commissioner back in 2013, but uh, there's been nothing for the last uh, eight years or so of that scale, but they're so useful because people, you know, the, the people have a great deal of common sense. And if you just engage them in a respectful way and let people think through and talk through these issues, I think you get you get tremendous outcomes. So I, I'm I'm confident because I know that places like Australia and Scotland have the potential to to power vast areas. Our the new energy resources that we have are the envy of the world. You know, uh, we can do so much. And as you say mining in Australia is is going to be a great. It's going to continue to be a great industry. It just won't be coal. It'll be cobalt or it'll be lithium or whatever. And that again, as you say present its own challenges. But um, but at the moment, we are in the decisive couple of years in terms of the crime, climate crisis. You know, We either get on top of this now or we risk triggering tipping points in Earth's climate system that can have very severe consequences. So I think you know what, what you're doing, Ian, is I suppose I'm trying to say is just, it's hugely important. And now's the moment it must be done. I think just on the back of it as well, they operate at different scales. So some of them are very local. We've actually got one in Devon just locally here. But having a national one that's sponsored by the Scottish government, what the hope, you know, we we delivered our we delivered our full report in May and the government has to report back in six months. That'll put it right in the shadow of COP. So we're pretty sure that'll be at the top table. And I think what that will do is give the politicians courage. I think they know the direction of travel. I think they want to go in that way, but they've got this kind of anchor they're dragging and they're very conscious they don't want that to drag them down. I'm sure that's the case in Australia. And I think that's what, so the, a difference was, you know, this came out of the Scotland Climate Act. So this thing's in legislation. So there's a, maybe a difference with Australia with the federal bit. But I think it seems to me that it's the, the, the ordinary punters, the ordinary people on the ground, given the politicians the right, the courage to say, be more bold. One of the lines yeah. in, the, in the report, it says, uh, maybe it came out right at the end, but it was really interesting. They said, we recognise this might not be enough. So they're even more radical in the proposals and they're still saying, we don't think this is enough to reach Paris. But, you know, if we go there, you can be more bold and we can you know, accelerate our, our progress. Yeah, I know you're so, you're so right. And I, I must say, at least in Australia, business is by and large on side with this transition. Not everyone, but a, but a very substantial number of businesses. And, you know, we can see in Australia, we need to deploy and construct seven times more solar and wind than we've ever done in our history, just to get to 100% renewable for, for the energy se electricity sector. We need to do that three times over to power our transport needs and our industrial needs. We can do it. We can do it very quickly. And the, the the sort of financial rewards for those who do that, I think, are very substantial. We need the right settings, and as you say, and we need the courage, really, of our politicians to to unleash that that shift. Mm. Tim, um, given what you and Ian have been discussing, but set against this context of the government setting up the Climate Commission, then disbanding it, and now your work with the Climate Council, all set against this seeming reluctance of politicians and business leaders to give up the long-standing love affair with coal. How do you think Australia is going to handle really significant events, political events and economic events such as COP26? And also you've got the, the plan visit from the, uh, President Joe Biden, um, who's coming to Australia. So how is that all going to sit and marry in terms of what Australia plans to do over the next, say, 12 months? Well, Vanessa, I think the, the truth is that, that our Prime Minister and, and Cabinet are going to have to make a decision. And they've put off making that decision now for way, way too long. We shall see uh, what that decision is. I really hope that they see the way things are changing. They see the inevitability of change and that they grasp the nettle and decide to move forward. Uh, I could be wrong. Maybe we'll st be stuck in the past. It, it, what that will do is cripple, cripple us economically into the future, very sadly. Um, 
I think there's enough momentum among, among the public, among businesses, and among many of the, the, the lower levels of politics to see some real movement here. So I am hopeful, but I'm cautiously hopeful. Ian, what about you? Well, I think that one of the things that's interesting is there's global interconnectedness, you know, and, and um, so it may well be that some of the future for Australia's, you know, the direction trajectory comes from places like India. So if India, for example, just continues to ramp up its renewables and moving into solar and, and wind and starts to wean itself off of Australian coal, that, you know, if people see the future of, of coal in Australia being in a disinvest, you know, ininvestable, uninvestable, that quick, that's a massive change, you know, that happens. So, you know, the, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there that want to change the whole capitalist system to, to move us out there. To my mind, the most, the, the biggest steer for us into a climate future is the capitalist system, but it's a capitalist system that is more, that has to move away from profit maximization to maximization of well-being in a much broader one. And you're getting governments like New Zealand and Scotland and, uh, and Iceland coming in with a well-being economy and, and a different set of values. And this was another thing that came out of the Scottish Assembly is moving away from GDP as an income marker or a, well, you know, a marker of value to well-being. And I think we're all in a better place if we start to broaden out and look at it in that way. And then, and then for example, as I say, Australia looks at our the future in a, through a completely different lens. And, and that will be the thing that will focus the politicians' mind. If you look at the long trajectory of human evolution, um, you know, this is probably the greatest shift that our species has ever undertaken. You know, we're, we're living together in much larger numbers than we ever have before. We're living more peacefully than we ever have before. We have the opportunity to do, as you say, and to create a well-being economy. We just haven't had that in the whole of human history before. And we're faced with this very immediate crisis. You know, I, I feel really privileged and energised to be part of that movement. I, I, not to say I haven't had enormous disappointments in, in my career, you know, when, when things have gone wrong, like at COP15 and, and consequently, but uh, we just got to keep on going. Whatever the decision the Australian government makes at COP25 is not, not the end of the story. Mm, we, we need to keep pushing on. Great words indeed. Well, look, thanks to you both for a fascinating conversation and some hope as well. Um, I suspect we could have gone on long into the night, but for the meantime, Tim Flannery, Ian Stewart, it's been a real pleasure. A however, pleasure thank you. However, thank you, be Vanessa. before we let you go, we do have, of course, one final piece of very important business to conclude. So Ian, I'm now going to hand over to you. Well, thank you. Thanks, uh, Ness. Um, yeah, so it's my huge pleasure. I've been a, a fan of this man for uh, for so long. It's an absolute pleasure to to confirm that we are awarding the Royal Scottish Geographical Society Gettys Environment Medal, uh, an honorary fellowship to Tim Flannery uh, for your sustained leadership of advocacy regarding climate change and other uh, environmental depredations globally over many years in the face of what I have to say has been persistent opposition and attack. You are incredible in your doggedness. Um, and also for your major contribution to the public understanding of global ecology and our system science through your popular ecological environmental uh, writing. So um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure. I, I believe you've got the award. I hope you've got the award. I, I feel I should be able to hand it to you, but I... Yes. But, but if, if you have, then, uh, then you're an absolutely very well-deserving recipient. Thank you so much, Ian. And um, the membership is, is um, I feel deeply, deeply humbled. And the membership is very meaningful to me. Um, if I could just say that it's COVID permitting, I will be, um, my shadow will be crossing the threshold of the society and I'll be making good use of that membership uh, before too long, hopefully. So thank you so much. Wonderful. It'd be lovely to see you over there when, when things settle down, but maybe in a, maybe in a right. Zoom one before then. So thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. OK, well, that just about wraps it up for now. My thanks once again go to the 2021 medalist Tim Flannery for sharing his insights to RSGS President Ian Stewart and also to you all for joining us. But for now, from me, Vanessa Collingridge, bye bye.
Now, I'm deeply honoured to be the recipient of this wonderful medal from the Royal Geographical Society of Scotland. I'm the Geddes Medalist for 2021. This is a critical year for climate change and I'll be using um, this medal and the publicity around it to try to really move Australia forward to create a deeper commitment uh, in this critical year when we'll all be meeting in Glasgow. And when I come to Glasgow, I'll definitely be dropping in on society because I'm now a member. Thank you so very much.